you know, there was, there was a comment left by somebody on the last video I made, and it's like, you, you need to give up smoking. Because I am, you know, I am, I do have a bit of trouble with a, a bit of a, a cough. Bit of a cough. It's like my health is deteriorating real quick. So it's like, uh, <clears throat> to give up smoking would probably be the end of me. Because I understand that it's it's part of like um, like a deep seated reflection of a a, a, a deep uh, psychic wound, and uh, smoking I see is is my only luxury and comfort. Although I have many, you know, I mean, shit, I've got a ninja air fryer. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, compared to the way that someone who was just poor, just a redundant worker. Um, would have lived 20 years ago. It's like I live like a millionaire, don't I? Got the internet. But someone come to me and say, you, you want to think about your health and you want to, you want to think about giving up smoking. It's like, ha! <laughs> I was told in, in like 2001 that I wouldn't live till, I, mean, I wouldn't live to 35. By a doctor who was absolutely 100% sure that she was right. So, what kind of moves did I make? Based on the fact that I was terminally ill. I, uh, I was told I could just um, collapse at any moment if stressed. And just have a heart attack and just die there, there on the spot. And she was like, I'm amazed you haven't just killed over and died yet. I still play football, so well, you, you're not going to be able to play football anymore. Excuse me? Well, it's too much of a risk. Like, as if my heart could just explode at any moment. She was absolutely 100% sure. So, the moves I made were like, well, I've been told I can't be a salesman anymore because it's a too stressful job. This is the NHS doctor telling my employers You've got to find him a less stressful job. And they found me a less stressful job. It's like, well, anywhere not working for us. So that was the end of my career. Because if you, if your doctor's written to your employers telling them that you, you need to be put on light duties because you're now being heavily medicated and um, you shouldn't be stressed at all. And you're me, who's just as much trouble as I can, you know, get away with being. At the same time. It was that figure. It's like my life was sabotaged and I believed it to be true. That I was a man who was who didn't have long to live. So what I did in the end was I couldn't bear to be on the beta blockers that were supposedly keeping me alive. So I stopped taking them and never went back to the doctors. And you whenever the NHS comes up, I'm like, oh them, those guys. And it really took me a few years. I had to talk to somebody who was, who also was, they'd not been told they were dying, but they could feel they were dying. To tell me, these doctors, you know, who the fuck are they? Guy who was having problems with doctors who just did not listen to him and just decided that he had a psychosomatic illness, but the pain was killing him. Took talking to that guy a good few times to come a real, you know, you're right. It's like I haven't been to see a doctor for years and it's like I, I didn't put it together like that, like so simply as you have, but it's like I just decided I'd rather die on my own terms and live than be on them pills and, and just wither away. Be seen as a liability, be seen as someone people have to make allowances for because she's on medication. What the fuck is that? Who wants to live like that? I couldn't do that. So I decided to just die. So I sold my house. Promising career.
abandoned. And then off in the world to, to, to seek out a stress-free job and knowing that there is no such thing. <laughs> you just get a different set of pressures, don't you? But I'm 48, I'm not dead. But I'd resign myself to being a dead man. So what's the point of me ever... I can't, There's no point of me ever um, building relationships with people, is there? Oh, there wasn't. Because I'm not going to be around for very long. What kind of dad would I be to be a, a, a man who knows he's not long in the world to abandon his children? So it's like... I've had it said to me, it's like, John, it's like, why do you know so much stuff? What is it that's different about you? I said, well, I'm a dead man walking. I've been a dead man walking now for, for 20 years and more. So I resigned myself to the fact that I was a dead man a long time ago. And I haven't done anything to stand in its way and live my life most days willing to take a punch in the face for what I think and say. It's like, what are you going to do to me? Kill me? I've, I've, um, I've beaten the estimate of how long I'm going to live so far by at 13 years when 35 was seen as being on the high side. So it's like, what are you going to do to me? What can you do to me? Now, have yourself that long thinking about things like that and being that brave and it's like you can be miles more observant than everyone around you and you can remember and you can be unfettered by emotional attachments that you're not conscious, conscious of because there are none <laughs> it's like be a dead man for as long as I've been a dead man and it'll be yeah I've learned a thing or two being dead for as long as I've been dead being no one for as long as I've been no one it's like yeah, yeah. I used to have a job where I'd have a near-death experience on the road. Average yeah, about once a week. You know, whoa! Sometimes just a reaction to something that happens suddenly, other times unknown as to how I made it. And then got used to living like that. feeling somehow, sometimes, somehow distant, depressed, not realising that what was making me depressed was the fucking near-death experiences I were having, causing massive hangovers to the endocrine system. It's like talk about being full of adrenaline, it's like talk about being a, a petrol head, and it's like, yeah, I, I do recall just being that. I'd be driving a car down the motorway, doing 100 mile an hour, being like, wow, my life's in my own hands. And it'd be, what a fucking fine thing this is. But it's only an illusion. The, the, the illusion, illusion of freedom on the open road is that any given second, 100 mile an hour, you can pick a spot you could hit where you're not going to hurt anyone else and just see yourself off. I wouldn't want to be the person who, who, who fucked everyone's day. At the, so, oh, no, no. And these people, they don't deserve to pay the price for my failure. And then it's an internal joke, isn't it? It's like, no, I wouldn't want to be that twat who made everyone late for work. What would that make me? It's like there are some sins that will never be forgiven. So it's like... <laughs> I live in that place. I get it where uh, always, every time I get questioned off like, 
old friends' wives and the like, how come you've never got married? And you, you, you start to try to tell them and they make their minds up. You just haven't found the right woman. You know, I'll fight and you're giggling. I'm giggling at them. I'm like, you just don't get it at all, do you? You're not listening. You're not a bad person, John. You'd make a cracking dad. You'd make a, you know, you just need a bit of encouragement and you need looking out for. And you'd be just fine. And I'm like, do you realise how silly you sound to me? So like I gave up a long, long time ago. Why? Someone convinced me I were a dying man. Wasn't. But living as a dead man for 20 years, I've broken down into becoming one. I am now, I think, a dying man. got nothing nothing so it's like when you got nothing you've got nothing to lose although that's not true because you can still be we can still suffer pain you can be left out on the road homeless but it's like I dare the world to throw me out in the street That's so why you make me famous. Do it. Throw me out in the street. Decide you're going to crucify me for what I might have to say. Let's see how that plays out for you. So it's like, I'm shit a bust. I can afford to. I, I, right, you won't hear me so often say things that are inflammatory or provocative. Well, I could. I could be as controversial as I like because I, I face no repercussion. Not from what the what these social me whatever they are can do. None. Have you noticed I don't? But every time I make a video I take free speech further than it's supposed to go. I don't tell people what I think, I tell them what I know. To be true. And uh The thing I tried to do is complete. Other people were happily for me on the same kind of mission and they caught. <clears throat> there's there's things that I I uh won't say on my channel but others are saying that were inevitable. I'm not going to fight out say it. There's a terrible truth that I won't say. I'll leave it for others to say and others are saying it. Let them say it. There are certain things that I wanted to see exposed. And it's like, the, the only thing I can do, no one's saving the world. But i tell you what, <clears throat> you can do a job towards balancing the scales with a bit of truth. A bit of truth start to reverse the situation real quick. But then you've got a situation as to where no one gives a fuck. It's easier to call me a uh, liability degenerate uh, fucking low life peasant it's easier to do that than to say what if he's right what if he's right when he says something like you know you're uh, <clears throat> you know why people on the internet sell outs you know people who have a voice right? I'll tell you why they sell outs most of them and why I'm not a sell out I use my real name and I've used my real name not hidden it but use my real name bang on my real name in everything I've done for the last decade 
and there are millions who won't use their real name on the internet and they'll have things to say they'll say controversial things and I'll be like all you do is feed the machine that those who would oppose you read and it, it, it validates their opinions of the cowards that you are and it's like all those people who post anonymously they need validation from people who you know speak on their behalf because they're too afraid to speak and it's like you, 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 your internet influencers have stolen their voices stolen their voices because they've been the ones who've been rewarded for having spoken using their real name and taken the risk of losing everything. And there's millions who haven't got the guts to do it. Millions who haven't got the guts to do it. And if you're not taking it to the limit, if you're just sitting on your laurels and deciding you've become a celebrity and start to, you know, you want to be the new Michael Parkinson or something, you have failed. You have sold out the people. You sold out. You were given a voice. You sold them out. Why? Because you stopped fighting. You stopped fighting for them. So then they find other people to fight for them. And they get more desperate. And they find themselves, themselves in the hands of more radical people who will tell them what they want to hear and ostensibly be seen to be fighting their corner while you guys just all shoot shit about what the news is and interview each other oh, you fucking sell out it's like you guys you're as detached as the left the right is as detached as the left they just talk a little bit more sense but it's a matter of who is playing who are you? I see the the right is reactionary and the left is creative. Tomorrow there'll be some bullshit they'll be spinning that'll throw to gaslight. One that I've been very keen on recently is stories of miracle medical breakthroughs. Like an RNA treatment that can cure you of alcoholism. <laughs> okay. Good story, isn't it? <laughs> Loads of them recently. A new miracle. They bu they're bugging it up, aren't they, for when they're going to say, we've transplanted the first womb into a man. The, 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 that They won't be able to do that, but they're going to say they can and they have. It's coming. Weeks away. <laughs> you can see it it's like they're, they're setting you up for a the shit testing you with all these little bullshit breakthroughs and then they're going to hit you with a big one <laughs> and I'm sure it's going to be that they'll say that they've managed to uh, graft a uterus into a bloke it's coming and then they'll just fake the outcome obviously won't they with just a bit of switcheroo and it'd be, look at this marvellous thing we've done. Just so they can say they can do it. It's coming. It's weeks off. <laughs> it's like, who, who are the real masters here? Who are the masters of illusion? Who are the ones who are conducting the orchestra? It's like... Those you, pref you, those you claim to be fighting against, like you, you've not won a single victory. They've underestimated you, and you've won a few tiny wins, but they don't underestimate you anymore. It's all you've done. They make sure now. They make sure. I'm there, I mean, I just sit and I look at it, and I'm like, yeah, I see a stitch up when I see one. It's like, as far as I see it, I mean, I live in a world where everybody lies to each other all the time. 
anything they feel they need they have to lie about they lie about it and they do it automatically and they're absolutely brilliant about it and the biggest crime is to accuse somebody of lying and spill other beans on them and to tell on them that's you sent to Coventry that's you a real villain not the guy who's cheating on his wife not the bloody burglar not the guy who robbed so and so's car, not the guy who smashed something, not the guy not the guy who did the harm. You. You're the one who's in trouble because you're the one who spoke about it. And that'd be the, the greatest crime. So it's like <clears throat> to go and be around my kind of people I grew up with, people I know, is to be sat in a room with criminals, and they're all criminals. All of them. They're all dodgy, every single one of them. There are the odd exceptions who know they're up to no good and I can live with them. But the rest of them who constantly lie, I can't. Because around them the greatest sin you can, so the greatest sin you can commit is to say, not really though is it, not really. And back up each other's lies. Have it worked out between themselves. The excuse, the prearranged story. <coughs> <coughs> it's like my first rebellion was to come out against that. I've never been forgiven for it. Just the flat out, just basic, you know, how <coughs> what the, the highest crime is to be the man who tells tales on others. The highest crime. Not the guy who does the crimes. The guy who tells the tales on him is the, is the worst offender. And I've, I learned that when I was knee high to a grasshopper. That you don't tell tales. <coughs> I mean, I used to go to schools where you could be viciously bullied and you could go to a teacher and say, I'm being picked on, so-and-so has hit me, they're all ganging up on me, and be punished for telling tales. Oh, you've been a telltale, are you? <coughs> so the, the uneven application of justice <coughs> in that moment teaches that child how to play exactly the same game. And then you learn that game. My lies are more believable than yours. Compulsive lying seven year olds. Compulsive lying seven year olds end up in the hands of predators, drawn to them. You want to learn some more tricks? Yeah, I'll show you a trick or two. too sick for me to invest in the world. Yes. I look at like where I live and, and think and they say, well, we'll bring new investment. The council will arrange it. We'll bring in new investment. And I look at it and I'm like, who the fuck right in the head would ever invest any money here? And they'd have to go into business with you. I asked myself that question 10 years ago and the investment still hasn't come. Maybe I might have been on or something. You can understand people who are motivated by money. They've got a real interest in not being sued. Seriously. A real interest in not being sued. When they say these businesses who are motivated wholly by profit. No, you can understand them. And you can you can demand justice from them, can't you, in the courts? But <laughs> your bureaucrat, your uh, political ideologue who works for the government and seems to think there's such a thing as a stress-free job, 
who's thrown down the, you know, I'm a doctor. Told you you're terminally ill, you're gonna die. Pretty much tell you, told him, told me to, you know, pack my bags and say my prayers. And then I go to people like my, my family and say to them, this is what the doctors told me. And their answer to me is, oh well, doctor's always right. Not, hang on a minute, no question of it, all fully trained to believe doctor. Believing doctors seen more of my friends dead early than not believing doctor. So it's like, I'm having trouble, I right, said breathing. But you'll not see me go anywhere near a doctor. Why? Because they'll just tell me I'm dying again. It's like, well, thanks for that. I, I, you told me that over 20 years ago and here I am. It's like, there's a thing about it though. It's like, they've got me on the books as being someone who's like dying. Right. So, when I did my run at trying to have this stress-free job, <clears throat> and I got injured, did my back in, I'm still in trouble with it now. Makes me unreliable, my bad back. It's, it's not fun. It's, it's nauseating. It, make, it really is terrible. And uh, I go in and like, um, I'm in trouble with this. There can something be done about it. And they always just ignored it. Why? Well, their medical records said that I was going to die anyway in the next few years. So what the hell would be the point of fixing me back? I'm written off. They won't ever spend a penny on me. I've understood this as being so for so long that, yeah, I'm, I'm a rebel. I'm a, I'm a dead man walking. I've long since resigned myself to the fact that I'm not going to be around for so long. And here I am, still here. So, uh, I mean, give up smoking. It's like, and lose me only comfort. Nope. I'll be smoking right up until the last minute I go. <laughs>